Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of The Dark Parade. Thank you once more for joining me on this, the final episode of our series on the Black Christmas films. Of course, we're talking about Black Christmas 2019 uh, today, the uh, much maligned sequel with Mark Ball. And this movie is uh, given a lot of grief, and I think rightfully so in in a number of ways, but I definitely encourage you to listen to this discussion uh, because I think we get to the root of what the problem with the movie is. And it really isn't uh, the wokeness of the movie, even though that was listed as one of the big problems with it. I actually think there is plenty of room in the world for a movie that criticizes rape culture on college campuses. Uh, but it, it has its problems. It doesn't really succeed in delivering on the thesis of the film. So, uh, at any rate, I think you're going to get something out of the conversation. I know I did. And, uh, yeah, so, listen, without further ado, let's just jump right into it. Here's my discussion with Mark Ball on Black Christmas 2019. Enjoy. All right, with me uh, once more is the uh, the lovely, the uh, the the dance hall favorite, Mark Ball. <laughs> that, that that is an intro I've never received before. Dance hall favorite, I like it. <laughs> yeah, so uh, you may know him from such podcasts as Doing the Nasty, uh, which is also one of the things he's known for in the dance hall. Yep, yep, <laughs> guilty as charged. So, uh, first of all, thanks for, for coming back and doing this. Yeah, and, absolutely, man. And second of all, uh, maybe sorry. Um, well, you yeah. know, I, I kind of took one for the team on this one. Like I, I saw the, uh, the thread when you're rounding up some, some co-hosts for the, the black, uh, black Christmas movies and nobody had picked this one. Like the, the first one went super fast and actually the, uh, the what is it 2009 is the other black oh six yeah yeah yeah. oh six yeah that that one went pretty quick and nobody swooped in on this uh the 2019 the the second go around and remaking uh the 74 movie and uh i i i I had not seen this i remember a lot of uh online discourse that was kind of insufferable surrounding this movie about two years ago but i i I kind of skipped this one because for reasons i don't watch a lot of horror movies after halloween basically I, i try and jam so much shit into october that like November and December are kind of like comfort food stuff. I'm off mm-hmm. work a lot too, so it's a good time to like marathon all the Lord of the Rings movies or all the Star Wars movies. That's kind of what I do until like the the beginning of the year or so, and you know some some other stuff starts coming out. But uh, yeah, nobody nobody really jumped on this one in the, in the group chat, at least that I could tell. So I was like, you know what? I I don't know what I'm gonna think of this movie. It might be great. It might be terrible. But I'm gonna. I, I got a really good one on the last episode of the show that I was on. So I was like, even if this movie sucks, you know, it it, it all kind of works itself out. Well, and I I was in the same boat you were because one of the reasons I wanted to do this series, as listeners uh, have no doubt grown sick of hearing me say is that I hadn't seen any of the Black Christmas movies prior to doing this series. Oh, really? Yeah, so it was really a journey of discovery where I saw the 74 Black Christmas, and I was, like, really knocked my socks off yeah. and and thought it was great, and then uh, watched the, the 2006 movie, which I had a blast with. I know that movie gets some, some static, but... Uh, I thought it was super fun. It's, I mean, is it the classic of the 74? Of course not, but it's, it's kind of ballsy and out there. I've, I've not seen the, uh, the 2006 one yet. I think people have kind of come around on it though. If I, if I can tell kind of from general consensus type stuff, I, I think when it came out, people hated it because it was pretty different than the 74 version, but I think people are kind of coming back around on it. It's just like a fun, goofy holiday horror movie kind of 
Oh, for sure. Like, it, there are some laugh out loud moments. It's super gory. The, uh, you know, it, again, it doesn't have the deft touch of a Bob Clark, you know, 74 classic. But, uh, you know, th- that's not what it needed to be. You know, Duh. it's very much of its time, for sure. And and I think the the 2019 Black Christmas also certainly very much of its time. But also, I mean, I, I guess the biggest complaint I have with it is that it feels kind of toothless. Yeah. Um, but it, so both of us are coming to this fresh. And so we'll we'll just dive into the the you know what's happening in this movie, which is very different than the seventy four and 06. Like oh oh six, basically takes the seventy four movie and kind of digs into the phone call portion of it and is like, what if this Billy and Agnes stuff was for real? And let's explore this kind of mythology that the movie uh, from seventy four hints at. And this movie, other than it being a sorority isn't really and there being a, a killer <laughs> there, there isn't really that much to do with either of the previous two films right and so it it is set at Hawthorne College and we are first introduced to a girl named Lindsay who is uh, walking home and starts getting stalked by uh, as it happens i think it's like the line producer or something that they got to fill this role (laughs) he kind of looks like a producer Uh, that wouldn't surprise me yeah just a dude kind of looking at his cell phone and following her and she's getting some some spooky texts you know like you do around christmas and uh anyway she thinks it's this guy but then he veers off and then she gets assaulted by uh, a guy in a black robe and a black mask and having just recently been watching the third season of slasher i was like oh this again only (laughs) (laughs) only this guy doesn't have neon for a face well all right whatever you say black christmas (laughs) He, he he chooses kind of a cool uh they, they go back to uh <laughs> they do the die hard two thing where uh uh she gets she gets stabbed with an icicle basically and uh because she, yeah she's she keeps getting these creepy texts so she runs up to like a door of the closest house basically knocks on and the uh dude at the robe answers the door and like uh she she kind of stumbles back and he reaches up and pulls an icicle off like the uh the the, the awning or whatever and stabs her with it she falls back and like very I, i'm sure they did this on purpose she, she makes a pretty deliberate like snow angel in the super fakey looking fake snow that they used in this movie mm-hmm. and it's kind of a cool image like they, they almost kind of had me had me with this cold open a cold open <laughs> this is gonna well, be well played, full, sir. full of puns unintentional or not uh but yeah there's some kind of cool imagery I, I think this is kind of a cool cool way to open your movie and then uh yeah we we get our opening credits after this and according to the director uh whose name i will look up as we're we're talking here it's sophia something i can't remember now but um that yes it looks like a snow angel but what they meant (laughs) was for it to look phallic which it kind of does but also (sighs) It like the the snow angel is the thing that leaps to mind because I was I was exactly the same as you. In fact, the um, director's commentary is with Imogen Poots, who uh, you may remember from uh, Green Room, where she right. was fantastic. Oh yeah, should I totally forgot she was in that? Yeah, and uh, Sophia Tikal is, is the director's name, and Imogen Poots actually says, "Hey, that snow angel looks great." That that's really cool, and Sophia Tikal is like, well, actually, that was supposed <laughs> to be uh, kind of a dick, and there there's phallic imagery sort of hidden throughout the movie uh, because this movie is very much living in the wake of like Me Too, and and it's very much about that. Yeah, uh, but yeah, you're right. It, it's like, well, that's not what I leapt to 
and it's also not what the cast of the movie left to now at least we're not the only ones yeah right so i think it's understand but yeah so we get to the the credits and then we kind of introduce our cast of characters which is um riley who is played by image and pooch she's you know certainly our main character of the film um there's chris and marty and jesse and you'll notice all of those names are sort of androgynous which was also right. intentional. Huh. Um, so, and th- there will be probably a running theme in this episode of me saying, I appreciate what it is they were going for. <laughs> yes. Because it is hard to argue with, uh, or at least for me, I appreciate the politics of the movie, the theme of the movie. Because that is something I've, you know, I, there, there's a, a terrific documentary about sort of rape culture on college campuses and just how toxic that is and how so much goes unreported and that kind of thing. And, and it, I mean, it's horrifying. And this movie is very much about that. And I think there is a world in which a movie about a serial killer stalking a sorority uh, can be a good statement about rape culture on campus. Absolutely. I mean, horror is like horror is probably the most like like political of like all movie genres. I think, and a lot of it. I mean, is j- lurking just beneath the surface, and like a lot of you know subtext and social commentary and stuff. But uh, yeah, I mean, I. Th- I- it's weird because I think when this came out, that was a lot of people's huge beef with this movie was the, the it's it wears its politics on its sleeve kind of. Uh, I think that's maybe like the best thing that this movie has going for it is like is that idea I think is really scary and a lot of people can probably relate to that. And uh, yeah, there there is a really good idea for a horror movie in this movie somewhere. <laughs> yeah, until you get to the mechanics of the movie and then you're like, oh no. But, yeah. but so the, the main character Riley is played by Imogen Poots. Uh, just to get this out of the way, the one one of the thrusts of her character is that she was essentially date raped by the head of this fraternity and uh, a guy named Brian, and no one in authority believed her 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 friends certainly do but again this is going back to the the culture at the time that this movie was made and and certainly moving forward this idea that women aren't believed the way that men are right and so she's definitely still traumatized by this is kind of trying to work through all this shit and they're having a big uh like dance number that they're doing at the local fraternity which begs the question why would they do this see i didn't i didn't go to college (laughs) i certainly never lived in like a frat or even like really hung out with like frat guys or frat girls so i don't know if this is a thing that they actually do on fucking college campuses so i was i was a little confused by some of this you know having (laughs) <laughs> been in a fraternity for a short time when I was in college um, there were you had sort of like your sister sorority that you would have parties with sometimes right. but at no point did anyone dress up in sexy Santa outfits and sing a song about date rape to us uh, which maybe they should have you know <laughs> I'm not saying they shouldn't have. I never saw anything like that happen. Like, most of the fraternity stuff that I went to was like, yeah, we're trying to score, but nobody was slipping roofies in any drinks or anything. It was Uh, just awkward conversation and, like, you know, hoping that they were going to get a little bit drunk, which, you know, is terrible. But that's just, you know, college at the time. Um, But uh, in this situation, these like, Riley has choreographed this whole dance and everything and so they go to perform this um and they, they're doing a whole song and dance where it's up on the rooftop but it's all about like getting slipped a mickey and getting 
you know, fucked by these fraternity guys. And Riley freaks out because the guy who date raped her, uh, Brian, shows up. And I do actually, again, I think the whole premise of this, of like, why are they showing up at this place? And why did Riley write this and decide to perform it at a fraternity if she had all these feelings about the head of that fraternity? Well, and she wasn't going to perform with them. There was actually like a fourth chick who gets a little bit too drunk right before they're supposed to go on. And Riley actually like fucking walks in as she's about to like basically be fucking taken advantage of, either, even though she's like, you know, three sheets to the wind. And yeah, like, well, what, what's, yeah. So, so they, they talk Riley into, you know, they're like, you know, all the words, you know, all the choreography, like, please, we need a fourth person for this for some strange reason. And yeah, when, when she gets up on stage with the other three, like the the scene kind of starts off where like she's not really like she can't get the words out exactly. Like she she's she's just like struck with like stage fright basically. And like right then, I was just like, why would you? Why would her friends like want or like try and convince her to do this, knowing that her her assaulter is in the fucking audience and they're about to sing a song about him and about their experience. This is a lot. I was very confused about it, this yeah. scene. Kind of, this is one of the weirder scenes in this movie. Yeah. And so the girl that she kind of saves, uh, is Jesse and Jesse, if I'm not mistaken, let me, yeah. So Jesse is, um, the one that she kind of rescues from from being because she's real drunk and and shows up and is like, hey, are you, do you want to be in here right now? And Jesse ends up leaving with her, and um, the the whole the, the the as they're performing the the dance, I do like that as she starts to seize up and like the sa- the stage fright kind of takes hold of her, um, that the other girls on stage sort of surround her yeah and, and kind of form this shield uh, uh you know so that she can kind of get her shit together and i thought that was a nice moment i was like oh okay well that that's a good way to visually represent that her sorority sisters are in fact you know totally have her back right and uh but uh she finally gets into it she comes around and while they're singing this, uh, you know, this dude, Brian, clearly is looking all pissed off at uh, uh, this is a, a, a bridge too far, you know, that he is uh, essentially being accused in his own fraternity house. The DKO, the Deeks, uh, <laughs> as they're called. Right. And uh, so aside from that. There's also another character that we need to talk about who is the the professor on campus. Oh boy, Professor Bad Guy. <laughs> yeah, Profe- <laughs> Professor Ben Shapiro. <laughs> oh boy, he, he is so obviously a fucking villain in this movie, like right from the get go. And there's some of the other characters are talking about uh, wanting to, I think they're like you know, passing it around. A petition to get him fired because he didn't pick any uh like all of the he's he's teaching like some some sort of literature course i think Mm -hmm. and like he all of his uh uh writers that he picked for the course are all like cis white males basically so uh they've got some people mad and there's a petition going around and yeah towards the beginning like before we get to the, the, the like dance number and stuff there's a scene where uh he's like he's teaching a class it is so obviously he is like some sort of villain uh it has it does get revealed until a little bit later in the movie but yeah he's uh this is maybe one of care that's carrie elwes right from Mm -hmm. from princess bride this is maybe one of his weakest performances i've ever seen him in which is kind of sad because he's made some dog shit movies from time to time he's a he's a great actor but man he is not being utilized very well in this movie he is bringing some real like guest spot on psych energy to this role <laughs> yes <laughs> <laughs> which i i know for a fact he he did um but yeah he is professor gelson not only is chris i think it is is who's uh, got the petition to get him removed there was another petition that imogen poots w- was 
uh, behind that got this uh, the the founding fathers bust removed from you know its place of prominence and moved to the fraternity house, the DKO fraternity house. So right. Be- because he was a, a slave owner and you know a racist and you know a misogynist, all all these terrible things. Definitely playing into current events a little bit, having the statue removed. Sure, sure. I, again, this yeah, we'll get to <laughs> all of it's this. It's very, it's very of its of its time, like you said. For sure, but it is so of its time. It, it really, you know, it's ripped from today's headlines in the way that like an episode of Law and Order was, where right. you know the, some heiress would go missing, and two weeks later on Law and Order. It's the case of the missing heiress, you know? But I, obviously the subject matter here is much more sensitive and it's much more important. It's just, it feels so overstuffed and so blatant. And, yeah. and like I said, I, I'm i on board with all of this, you know? I come from a town where they just recently took down this god-awful statue of Nathan Bedford Forrest. Right. And could not have been happier about it, yada yada absolutely but it's just so on the nose there's there's definitely something to be said for a little bit of subtext and not uh you know let let the let the audience get you know their own interpretation out of it kind of and you don't have to like smash people over the head with a sledgehammer like you know it's it's anyway (laughs) yeah yeah like you know like the movie relic for example is a terrific allegory about dealing with a relative with dementia. Right. But at no point in the movie does anyone mention dementia, you know? Or maybe, yeah, I I take that back. They do, but it's like, oh, it turns out that it's something else. But also, that's totally what the movie is about. But it never feels didactic. And that's the problem, is this movie is climbing up on a soapbox every chance it gets to tell you how you should feel about all and and i think that's where the problem lies it's like just just be a horror movie with this as your backdrop but it's more like well this is a political statement with elements of horror and and again that is not it's it's not that i don't agree with it it just doesn't make for a very entertaining movie (laughs) exactly yeah it's it's what they tried to do, I think, is admirable, and there's not really currently. Well, I don't know. There are other horror movies that have come out in the last couple of years that I think explore some of these similar themes. But yeah, like you said, it doesn't. When, when you're smashing people over the head with it, it doesn't. It, it, it wears out its welcome kind of fast. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, the, there's this bus that got removed. Uh, Professor Gelson uh, in this big classroom scene talks about he quotes uh who is it is it maya angelou who who is the woman he quotes i think so yeah that's all about like you know being uh sort of a stand by your man kind of passage of of like you know uh you, you should be if not subservient you should be sort of in service to the man that you're with and that kind of thing and yeah, know your know your place kind of very much and but he does one of those and do you know who wrote that that's right this famous female writer it's so, a lady right it, totally it's a lady <laughs> it's so dumb and and every but uh, to their credit all the girls in this class are just like oh for fuck's sake yeah of course <laughs> yes yes if you you can find a passage from a female writer that is is probably a little bit backwards thinking but also that ain't the point you don't have any women writers on this syllabus and that's the problem right and he but uh, again this is like Carrie Elway's in this movie is just the like you said he is the cis white male writ large like that is his personality is he he is a you know incel waiting to happen he's got a really goofy accent in this movie too I don't know what he was going for with his accent but he sounds like 
uh, I don't know, like a, a 17th century dandy or something. I, I don't know what the hell he was going for with the, the, the way he delivers dialogue in this. It's, it's, it adds to the, like, okay, he's a bad guy. We get a movie. Yeah, yeah. And anyway, so there's that stuff going on. There's also the introduction of a character named Landon, who is like seemingly a decent guy who is flirting with Riley. Yeah. And uh, while they're at the uh, the fraternity doing this like choreographed dance and stuff, Riley gets a look at um, this ritual that's going on for new pledges of the Deeks. <laughs> oh, yeah. I forgot about this scene. Another one that's like... Uh... <laughs> giving us a little bit too much of a peek into the future of this movie it's like you maybe wanted to save the like creepy cultist stuff for the end like don't be putting that shit in the first like 15 20 minutes of the movie it's just like all right well i know kind of where this is going but yeah it's it's all these like dorky fucking frat dudes like yeah around the the bust of the the school founder and they're they're doing i i don't know but part of it also kind of makes me think of like animal house like especially later in the movie when we see them all like carrying around the fucking paddles and stuff it's like all right well yeah maybe you know they're they're just taking their 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 frat shenanigans like a little bit too far but we already kind of know this is a horror movie so like it's kind of obvious that this is gonna come into play a little bit later in the movie yeah especially because there's black goo leaking out of this (laughs) founder statue that they've got in their strange ritual room yeah. and are like rubbing it on the new pledges and uh, right it's one of those things where the movie just tips its, its hand a way too much in in this opening yeah. uh but yeah and so from there we get the scene with helena is, is actually who's about to be uh sexually assaulted and riley helps her out and then takes her place in the talent show and all that stuff and then when they leave Riley and Landon kind of flirt on their way back to the sorority house but back at the house Helena is I think she's uh, unstringing lights is is where she gets got Uh. and anyway but it's because this movie is PG-13 you just see this shape kind of come out of nowhere in the attic and grab her and that's kind of end of scene i think that had to have been a reference to exorcist 3 the way that that one is shot because she's kind of wandering around she's she can hear something i think and like uh it's it's kind of a they, they tried to do like a little bit of misdirection basically like where our attention is kind of the, to the right of the screen and then yeah the killer guy like comes very quickly we get the uh the the big sting and the score kind of and yeah he he wraps some christmas lights like around her throat it's kind of an effective jump scare but like as soon as it was over i was like oh well i mean they just tried to do like basically exactly like the the, the shears scene in exorcist 3 kind of which i mean i i guess if, if you're if you're gonna ape ape something ape the best <laughs> so i i can't really fault him too much for that sure sure uh so she ends up uh disappearing and then the next day um th- all of the girls start receiving these uh instant messages um from th- uh, an account linked to Caleb Hawthorne who is the the founder and uh which we as the audience know these are very similar to the ones that this girl Lindsay got at the beginning of the movie uh, before she got killed and then Bran one one of the other sisters she gets got how does she get killed I don't even remember um mm, she's looking she's she the one that's looking for her cat that's maybe, right. maybe that maybe yeah. that's the one I'm thinking of where she gets like strangled with the lights I don't remember how the how the other chick gets got yeah well there's the the one in the attic is the girl that ends uh, we'll see later in the movie but yeah so this girl Fran gets killed um, and a lot of this stuff happens like super quick and then it's off screen because again, this movie's PG 13 and until you get to the end of the movie, it's relatively bloodless. 
Which I think I read somewhere wasn't like because uh, Blumhouse isn't Blumhouse is like the production company on this. They're not afraid of putting out R-rated horror movies. This is a remake of a fairly gnarly R-rated horror movie from the seventies. I think this was more the director's choice because she kind of wanted this to be able to be seen by uh, a younger female audience. You know, like the you know fourteen, fifteen, sixteen year old kind of age range which i I was kind of surprised that because this was also put out by universal and i was like i wonder if they maybe just didn't have a lot of faith in this and they just wanted you know the pg-13 kind of ensures that you're gonna your movie's gonna get seen by the the teeny bopper crowd but uh, yeah evidently that was a choice by the director yeah which turns out not to be a great choice because nobody went to see this movie yeah, they, they might as well have just done this R-rated, and that, that would be, you know, one less thing I have to complain about this movie is that there's <laughs> at least a little bit of blood. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, so uh, Fran is gone, and then when Helena turns up missing, this is where Riley goes to the campus security guy, who, of course, is a, flat sh- a fat schlubby dude who is... <laughs> constantly eating a sandwich as he's like yeah and i'm sure that girl friend of yours uh i'm sure she's fine uh, it's kind of a typ- typical movie security guard or cop yeah yeah i uh she probably ran off with her boyfriend or something it's fine <laughs> it's just completely fucking useless right d- does not even attempt to do any police work and so she leaves there in frustration ends up running into carrie elway's outside the fraternity house where he has a box of suspicious papers <laughs> it's, like, it's it's like a fucking hit list that he drops so we get a list and yeah we can clearly see riley's name on it and a bunch of other of her friends name on it and again this is, this is a case of this movie you're showing your fucking cards a little bit too early you could have used carrie Elwes' character as kind of a red herring but you're making it so goddamn obvious early in this movie that he is like head bad guy. Right. Like in the original movie, one of the great things about it is it does that head fake to cure Dulia. And yeah. you're like, oh, maybe he's the killer. And, you know, oh, maybe he's not. Maybe it's this other guy. And that actually makes your movie fun when you don't know exactly who the killer is. But by this point, you've seen a crazy ritual involving black goo and Carrie Elways with a list of names of girls who are getting text messages from the, uh, from a text account of this founder who is leaking black goo. Yeah. And you're like, all right, well, I, I mean, are you, is is this so obvious that you're going to fake me out? Uh, but it turns out no. Um, but yeah, so, there's uh, a scene where Marty, one one of the girls in the house, has an argument with her boyfriend, Nate. Um, and it's kind of the theme of the movie is him being like, hey, what do you, why are you mad at all, men? I'm not like those guys. <laughs> I could not fucking believe in the scene that they actually had a male character say, not all men. And yeah, their, their response is, did you just not all men me? It's like, oh, this is this is gonna age like fucking milk. I mean, I hope, I guess, I hope a lot of the issues that this movie is kind of, you know, b- making statements about are not such an issue. Maybe 10, 20 years down the line, I don't really have that much faith in humanity, so this will probably still be fairly relevant after the fact. But yeah, just kind of just the most unsubtle like screenwriting in a movie I've seen in a long time, and I kind of I kind of laughed out loud at that scene. Like the, the, it could have been, it could have been like you know, it it could have been a lot different. But uh, they 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 chose the no subtext route, and I, I kind of rolled my eyes on a lot of this. Yeah, well, and another thing that uh, came up in the director's commentary is that argument was much longer originally, and it started off small and then just escalated to the point where she was kicking her boyfriend out. But because it was filled with so many f bombs they cut it all all of the the like escalation points of the argument out so that it just goes from zero to 90 where you're like whoa 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 like i understand that you're upset about what your boyfriend said but also 
there is absolutely no point where you know it it should have escalated like this and, yeah. But apparently all that was just left on the cutting room floor because it was before they realized that they were going to go for a PG-13. And so the argument was just much more profane. Right. And anyway, yeah, so, but like you said, the the problem with it and, and really with the whole movie is just that everything is right there on Front Street. There is nothing subtle about anything that happens in this movie. And that, that gets real frustrating because I like a movie that's kind of challenging, you know, and and I don't, you know, again, everything this movie is saying is correct. It's it's not. It, it goes back to that all the presents men line. It's not what you did; it's how you did it. Yeah, and no, there's 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 shitloads of great horror movies that have like a really strong uh, kind of feminist angle to it, especially in the last like 10 years or so. I was just kind of thinking about the movie revenge and like how yeah. that, how, how much better, like it explores a lot of the same ideas, but like, it's, it's, you know, not quite so in your face with those ideas and how, how much more effective that is. Like there's, or like may, I think is as a lot of this kind of, or, or the wolf. Ginger, the woman, yeah, the woman, Ginger snaps, even ginger American snaps. Mary. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, there, there's there's tons. Of, yeah, I mean, this is which that was, I think, a big thing that made a lot of the discourse around this like super fucking obnoxious because like I I feel kind of bad for a lot of the like I was kind of skimming through a lot of letterbox reviews and I felt kind of bad for a lot of the males that reviewed this that had to put in their review somewhere. This isn't a misogyny thing. This isn't because I hate women. This isn't because I hate the idea of a feminist horror movie. It's just how they did it, like yeah. you were saying. So, anyway. Yeah, it, it's like when that, was it 2016 that that Ghostbusters movie came out? Yeah, yep, exactly. It was like that all over again. Yeah, where it's like, I like all of these actors, and I wish this movie had been funny and good, but it wasn't. Nah. And you know or again totally my opinion but it had nothing to do with the fact that the the movie was female centric i got no problems with a female centric movie i just want to be entertained by it in a way that doesn't feel you know kind of patronizing which this movie kind of does at times yeah and which and, i mean it's it's intended for yeah i mean like we we've we're a little bit older now we're a little bit wiser like uh, maybe i don't know maybe a lot of these things like seem super obvious to us but if we were like you know a 15 year old girl maybe they're not so obvious i i didn't really consider that until like just now sure sure uh, yeah but also i still think it's just not giving credit to the viewer at all like even even, nah. even younger viewers i think especially today are a little bit more sophisticated yeah, you know that's, that's that's true but at any rate we'll bag on this movie on the back end but <laughs> um so after this argument just explodes in the sorority house riley uh is also pissed at chris who uploaded the video of the talent show and so riley is now like well you kind of fucked us because all these fraternity guys who are probably the ones sending us these, you know, poison pen pal letters uh, or, or texts that they're going to amp up. Like, we're missing one of our girls in case you forgot. And um, then we get a call back to the original movie where this girl, Jessie, goes up into the attic and she's getting some Christmas lights and gets killed there and her body is left up in the attic uh much like uh is it claire from the original movie i think is the character's name oh you're asking the wrong guy i'm horrible with movie names um but at <laughs> any rate so it's kind of a, a nod towards that which is nice and right. then uh you've got riley and chris and marty who are getting a bunch more text messages and as one thing leads to another all of a sudden a dude with a bow shows up to shoot an arrow at marty why a bow i is it because of archery in college is that still a thing i, I didn't understand that i think it's also a phallic thing 
of what weapon looks most like a dick. Well, you're, an arrow is kind of like shooting a dick at somebody, maybe? But also a knife. I mean, think about how phallic that is. <laughs> it, right. it gets stuck in you. <laughs> right, well, it goes back to, what was it, Slumber Party Massacre? You know? Oh, yeah, the giant drill. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's that kind of thing. Only that movie was real feminist, but in a real subtle way. Yeah, yeah, that's another great one. And, yeah, so... I, I think that's the idea, but I don't know for sure. It, it doesn't make a lot of sense. It's not a great, it's not a great weapon because it takes too long to fire. You know, right. uh, you miss that first, that first shot, which you know it doesn't entirely miss, but doesn't take Marty down. Um, then you're you're open to attack at that point. Uh, at any rate, so <laughs> the girls all run away though. Uh, nobody is like, oh well, he shot the uh, the arrow. Get him! It's just like, oh, we're, we got to get away. So they they end up locking themselves away until Riley is like, you know what? I'm gonna go get my phone, and then we're gonna call the police. And Chris is like, all right, well, I think Jesse went to the attic, so I'm gonna sneak up there and warn her. And that's where she discovers, oh, Jesse is in fact fucking dead. Ah. Uh. And then Nate, the boyfriend that was having the argument with Chris, shows back up to apologize. And then he gets got by the, the black robed figure. And Riley uses his car keys to essentially stab this guy uh, in the mask to death. And Which I, I thought was kind of a nice choice because I do know that that's a thing that they teach women in like self defense. Like if you're being like followed to your car or something, you kind of pack your uh, your keys in your fist like a you know, almost like a pair of brass knuckles or something. I thought that was kind of a nice touch for sure. And I think it's Lindsay at the beginning of the movie does the same thing. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, I agree. I thought it was it was like oh okay, well that <laughs> if. if it would be nice if the movie did more of that because at no point does anyone in the movie say, Hey, you use those keys. Like we were taught in defense class because that's kind of the problem with the movie is that usually when something happens, somebody points out, uh, why, why that is relevant. Yeah, exactly. Um, but so in, anyway, she ends up Riley ends up hook, hooking back up with Chris and Marty. Two more of these mass dudes show up and uh start going after them marty gets wounded i think she gets stabbed but she ends up buying time for riley and chris to get to the kitchen and hide before she ends up dying i forget does she is she the one that just like basically gets her neck snapped like she just walks up and turns her head backwards yeah yeah okay I, I think that's right. And then, so Chris and, uh, sorry, Riley and Chris end up attacking one of the, let's just say what they are, the, one of the frat boys um, who has come into the kitchen. And when they, after they kill him, they pull off his mask and they realize like, oh, he's got this black shit on his face that we saw in the room uh where they were doing the ritual with all the the you know new fraternity pledges and she's like and riley says like oh that was a pledge i saw in case you know you forgot the thing that <laughs> happened a, a few minutes ago <laughs> right and um so they decide to get the hell out of there and they get nate's car and this is where the movie gets really kind of silly because Riley very quickly is like, you know what? I remember them saying that Caleb Hawthorne that uh, had the bust, what was leaking all the black shit was known for dabbling in black magic. And because I saw it leak leaking that black stuff and them rubbing black stuff on the pledges, I bet what's going on here is, is that that is somehow responsible for the killings 
and all the the black goo is is uh, uh, uh like the key to all of this it's black magic or sorcery or some shit this is definitely kind of where this movie lost me big time yeah like it could just be that these guys are assholes Exa- yeah, exactly i that would have been a way better fucking choice right so chris ends up um saying like we should go to the police and riley is like fuck that we've been to the police you know what happened when i went to them about my my sexual assault they didn't believe me they're not gonna believe us now we've got to take care of this shit ourselves and so they decide to go to the dko fraternity to have a big battle and they they kind of which is where what they do they go to uh to to the deke house and riley goes to confront all the members of the fraternity and runs into landon um and he you know he's like so wait what the fuck is going on with the head of caleb hawthorne and she's like don't worry about it just come with me help me get inside the fraternity and we can stop this and he's like stop what now Wait, <laughs> a bunch of people got murdered and you don't want to go to the police. How about I go with you to the police? And she's like, no, no, no. Fuck all that. We are going to the fraternity and we're going to stop this black magic ourselves. And he's like, whoa, 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 black magic. What the fuck is happening again? But sure enough, Landon is a good guy and goes along with it. And uh, Chris then... um stumbles across uh the, the sorority uh Lindsay sorority which um had uh pissed off the deeks because uh they didn't want to take part in the talent show and she discovers here that oh Lindsay sorority sisters are also being attacked by these DKO pledges and is like all right I'm going to rescue you guys but first off to the deke cows and that's where we catch up with Riley and Landon who break in, but Landon ends up getting, uh, sort of captured by the fraternity brothers who force him into this ritual where they put this black goo on his head. And so, uh, like Riley and, and Landon are being held in this ritual room. The Caleb Hawthorne bust is leaking all this black shit and they use that to kind of paint the D- the delta symbol on Landon's head and then he starts to get all fucking crazy. He falls right in line with all the other fucking frat boy cultists. Right, right. And um anyway, she also finds Helena, uh Riley does in in the fraternity. Like she runs all finds Helena and then Helena knocks her out when she she's a benedict out. arnold yeah turns out she's a traitor <laughs> and so when she wakes up she's back in the ritual room where carrie elways has shown up in his robe the uh the dude brian the guy who assaulted her is there all of the frat boys who have giant paddles landon is there like everybody's all gooed up and is uh you know on board with the patriarchy and this is where carrie elways delivers the exposition speech (laughs) it's a long soliloquy dude it's fucking terrible it's really bad this is is, uh this is this is not how you want to end your fucking movie with the goofiest goddamn scene in the entire thing i think this is really kind of the low point of the film is him walking around to borrow a phrase mansplaining what is going on in this movie (laughs) yes exactly (laughs) uh it's so fucking bad he's like if if all the women would have just fallen in line we wouldn't have to be doing this if you just be good subservient women then we you know you you still can be this is why we're keeping your your friend around she she's one of the good ones so uh you know she she does what we tell her to and it's 
it's all so so ham fisted. It's oh, my eyes about rolled out of my head during the scene. Yeah, it, right. I mean, it's all about like, well, you know, once we the uh, bus got banished to the fraternity, that's when we discovered all this black magic happening, and and then they murder Helena, um, just for like just to prove a point just to be like oh yeah like these guys are so brainwashed that they'll kill her even though she was doing her part like she didn't do anything wrong in the eyes of this fraternity they're just fucking killing her to kill her and yeah it's right it's just dumb (laughs) so dumb and then so Brian makes Riley bow and she's about to like go after him like she's not taking this shit but at this moment as you know Riley is about to be forced onto her knees and or killed as she stands up for herself the doors bust open and all the sorority sisters that have survived the the attack are now busted in and there's just a big battle royale with all the sorority sisters and the fraternity guys and ballroom blitz plays (laughs) does it no but it should (laughs) it might as well have (laughs) i would have loved it it could have been if they could have done so much with this like i I like the idea of this, like a bunch of fucking the girl gang just showing up and beating the living fuck out of a bunch of trashy dudes. But it's just got this just goofy fucking angle to it. And like, yeah, the, like, I think you could have just taken all of the supernatural shit out of this movie entirely and just made these guys just straight up scumbags. And I think it would have worked a lot better. Maybe not a lot better, but it would have worked a lot better <laughs> than what we got here. Yeah, I like the idea. This is another scene where I feel like the PG-13 kind of hurts it a lot. Like, I, I could have dealt with some, you know, fairly gnarly carnage. Like, if they, if they would have built these guys up to be, like, a little bit more scumbags and less, like... uh faceless stormtroopers in a fucking weirdo like devil cult basically uh there, there could have been some like pretty rad like fight scene and stuff stuff happening at the end of this but it's all fairly like toothless like you said it's it's not really and it doesn't last very long it's kind of a short scene like this whole, the whole movie kind of wraps itself up fairly abruptly and I just don't know. I don't know what they were thinking. (laughs) What were they thinking? I don't know. The most egregious example of what we're talking about here is when Chris is about to murder one of the frat boys and she yells, suck my hard cut. Nah. You couldn't even say dick in a PG-13 movie? That wasn't... Maybe... maybe. That's not what the line was going to be. It was going to be her yelling, suck my clit. I, I think I like that less good. <laughs> I, it, regardless, just have her say something because it feels like, oh, this was the moment from the trailer. That Because you can't say it in a trailer, but then you get to the movie and you get the goods. Except there are no goods. There's no uh, goods to get got. It's, it's, such, it's such a tease. That it could have been something and they just fucking chopped its legs off. Yeah, it like you said it, it it there's not much of it you don't have any investment in these characters really they end up grabbing landon um and get him out because he's one of the good ones and they lock these fraternity brothers and like my big argument is like well aren't all of these guys just brainwashed then like you saved landon cuz you knew him but these other guys are just brainwashed too well, and she, one of them runs up and smashes the bust, like, on the ground. Yeah. Which, like, I kind of got the impression, like, at least in Landon's case, that that, like, broke the spell, was, like, smashing the bust. This is, like, uh, this is, like, fucking Disney Channel-level writing, basically. <laughs> but, so, like, yeah, why, why didn't the spell break? Why did it break for Landon, but not the rest of them? And they all get burnt alive. Right, and, and let's not forget, as Carrie always explained, 
the black goo allows them to be possessed by the the spirit of Caleb Hawthorne, who can show them the proper way that patriarchy should be established or whatever. And maybe after a while, you're just good with it. Like, you know, if you've been brainwashed for long enough, that's just who you are now. It's like if you were born in the 1950s, you're just never going to accept gay people or something. You know, <laughs> this movie didn't didn't bother to explain any of that, right? Yeah, I because as soon as they set this place on fire and are starting to burn alive all these fraternity guys, like you're right, the the Brian dude needs to go because he was date rapey and a, a real shithead. But the other guys were just brainwashed, right? So why kill the? Uh, I guess we're just burning them all, <laughs> like God sort them out, you know. <laughs> pretty much and and then that's it that's the end of the movie is you know like they just kind of get outside the house and l- watch as this place burns to the ground and yeah, we, we don't even get any like like witty quips after this or like a scene of them like driving away like good 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 game team like no it's this is well they burn them alive roll credits yeah yeah and uh there's a post credit scene <laughs> oh yeah the cat yeah where the cat that was uh Fran's cat at, for the MKE sisters or whatever is licking up some of the black goo at the DK, DKO place but I'm assuming this is pre burning or is it post burning because then why is this cat not in just like charred ruins because that's not what it seems like I'm not really sure what the hell the point of the post credit sequence was. Are they implying that the cat is going to become a horrible frat boy misogynist because he's he's drinking the goo? It's it's not really. I don't I don't know what the point. Of it was. Look, there is nothing worse than a cat who is also a date rapist. <laughs> <laughs> my 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 cat is very in touch with his. Uh, <laughs> Well, that's not true. He's he's lived away from uh, any other any other cats, especially female cats. So he he might be a woman hating cat for all I know. I don't know. My yeah, I've got one that had he got snipped so quickly that I don't know that he's ever had a Randy thought in his life. He's <laughs> he's never known the the touch of a woman. <laughs> no. I mean, I've got a female cat too, and she's also fixed. So both of them are just li- living these neutered lives. <laughs> where they you know they exist together but there's no love um there's no sexual tension between them or anything <laughs> so yeah i i, I big time I, I was hoping maybe they might have said something on the, the the director's commentary what the fuck was the point of the post credit sequence but i'm guessing they didn't well she she mentions that it exists like she points it out like oh hey don't go anywhere there's this post credit sequence but at no point was it like well this means it, you know which would have been nice because I, I you're right I don't know what the point of it was and it's oh it's so frustrating but that's it that is the 2019 Black Christmas and to move on to phase two of this discussion let's talk about performances for a second we already talked a bit about Carrie Elway's being absolutely terrible in this movie yeah um I think all of the 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 female leads in the movie acquit themselves well enough I don't think anybody's terrible and I think Imogen Boots is a good actor and I like watching she's got yeah she's got real real screen presence I mean yeah like green room look no further than that she's incredible in that movie uh and yeah i i, I agree i don't aside from carrie ellis i don't think anybody's really bad in this movie i think they're just reading badly written dialogue mostly the, yes that is the big problem is that the dialogue is really clunky it's either way too on the nose or it's it, it it's a little too pop culture it you know it's not as bad as like a diablo cody kind of movie where everybody is like three degrees cooler than you want them to be oh yeah but it it, it's just like everybody is is telling you their feelings all the time and it's just not how people talk 
Right. And, and it's, again, you're, you're complaining about a movie called Black Christmas that is the second remake of a film. But, again, I would argue that 2000 Remake does something interesting and different with the story. And there is an interesting and different movie buried under all of the bad writing and I would argue not especially great direction. Um, like, I don't think it's bad, but it, it, it it's just not... There's nothing really captivating about any of the shots in this movie. Yeah, I'm not really sure if it's the directing or the editing, but everything just felt extremely obvious. Like, all of the jump scares you can kind of see coming from a mile away. Like, uh, even the, especially the one where the chick is up in the attic... And the camera does the uh, like the back and forth kind of thing where we're looking at like what the character is looking at, and it kind of goes back and forth about three times. Mm -hmm. And on the third time, like all of the negative space behind her suddenly lights up, and of course the dude is back there. It's just it's it's so fucking obvious, and I I don't know if it's I, I don't know if it's just me, and I've just seen fifty billion horror movies at this point, and I can kind of see that stuff coming, and maybe it's not so obvious to like a. 15 year old and this may be like one of the first horror movies they're they might be watching god that's a sad thought this would be something to turn a young viewer off of horror movies they're like these movies suck uh but i don't know i i, I think there's there's some all right cinematography in this and i kind of like some of the sets the fake snow bothers me a lot the uh the the way that they dress the cars in this with the fake snow really bothers me because uh, I, I live out in the Rocky Mountains. We deal with snow and shit like a good, I don't know, eight months out of the year. Nobody just leaves a whole shitload of snow on their car. You sweep that shit off and so you can see out your windows. You're not... Anyway, th this was clearly shot in, like, Los Angeles or something. Because all the fucking snow in this movie is fake as hell. But, it, it was um, actually in New Zealand was where this was shot. No, Okay, another, another tropical subclimate. So, yeah, right. it makes sense. Um... Yeah, so, all right, so a quick discussion of the themes of this movie, because as, as we said earlier, I think that's kind of the strongest element of the movie, is that yeah. it definitely has a perspective, it has something to say, I don't think the execution of that is very good, but it is very much a movie about women being believed, it's about the corruptive influence of the patriarchy and how... Uh, you know, a, a lot of times, like, you you can't be the the kind of guy that is going to give the, you know, I, I, hey, I'm not all men, you know, like like I think when it's it's doing that stuff, it, it, that's where the movie is kind of at its best and at its worst because yeah. it, it's at least saying something and it's addressing something within the culture. But also, it just never has a deft enough touch with any of that to make it feel like it's not just a pamphlet that someone is handing you. Yeah, it's it could have been like I said. I mean, these are these are themes that have, to to a certain degree been explored in especially horror movies for decades. I mean, I, I would call the original seventy four one like a fairly. Uh, pro pro feminist movie. I mean, it's it's like it's one of the first movies that I can think of, like offhand, where there's like discussions about abortion and women's rights and stuff. And that's 1974. That's like mm -hmm. almost 50 fucking years ago, and it did it so much better. And I, yeah, I I I think that's a big part of this this version is I, I don't know maybe a screenwriter or the director like just didn't really know how to do that and make it clever or entertaining so they just put everything in the kitchen sink all of their politics up on the screen and i don't really blame a lot of people for being super turned off by a lot of that i mean there's I mean, there's got to be a good cross section of those people that are genuinely like misogynistic chuds basically but like i don't Again, it, it kind of bothers me that, like, uh, it, it seemed it, it was the Ghostbusters thing again, where, like, you can't say bad things about a movie like this without somebody turning on you and saying that it's because you hate women or something. That's well, a million percent not the fucking case. It's just not a very good movie. <laughs> like, I mean, 
even if it, it was, if he took the same movie and you took all the politics and bullshit out and kind of essentially still made kind of the same movie, it's still clunky and corny and bad and has a terrible ending and just feels incredibly toothless. Like, I don't know, like, like kind of like uh, you, you put it really well, like it's kind of the best thing that this movie has going for it. And it's kind of the worst thing that this movie has going for it is how much it wears its politics on its sleeve. Because, yeah, I think I think there's like, like we said, there's a really good movie hiding in here somewhere, but it's just not not up there on the screen. Yeah, and it doesn't involve goo leaking out of a bust of the the founding father of the university or whatever like that. It's just too silly. It's and, it, and it it takes away from the fact that guys legitimate in real life leg- legitimately are just awful fucking pieces of shit. Like they should have just rolled with that and not put this goofy supernatural bend on it like you know you don't have to guys are fucking trash on their own yeah i think that i would have liked this movie a ton more is if like just the pledge prank of this fraternity was to kill these sorority sisters that dared point out the patriarchy you know yeah like that's a more interesting movie to me than oh they got brainwashed by the black goo coming out of this bus because that rem- that removes agency from it exactly yeah and, and totally i think you're right i think uh, you know not that we fixed the movie but it would have made it much better if they were fighting actual people and also like you said like have have a scene with these guys where we understand how shitty they are wow. you know where we uh get uh, like this there's that great scene in night of the creeps where after the fraternity guys send uh the you know spanky and alfalfa off to go get the dead body where you get a moment with the fraternity guys all talking about like oh we're never gonna let them in the fraternity but it'll be fun if they show up with this and it's like oh you guys are just all pricks Yep. You know, and and I'm not saying you steal that directly, <laughs> but you have that moment where all these fraternity guys are talking amongst themselves and you get an eye and also hide the fact that it's more than one person as long as you can. Yeah, they gave that away super fast or maybe I don't know. Again, it's uh, everything about this movie is super obvious from the get go. But like, yeah, that but that would have been a cool, you know, kind of surprise. Right, if you had it, like, if you had danced around the idea of like, oh, is it this shithead fraternity guy? Is it this shithead fraternity guy? And you kind of do some what you think are red herrings, and then reveal that it's all the shithead fraternity guys, and it's like, oh, okay, well that makes sense, and also that you're making a point about, well, it's not just one bad apple; it, it's the whole system. I think we I don't might know, man. have fixed this. I, 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 yeah, I, think, I was just going to say, I think, I think we're writing a way better movie <laughs> right now than this fucking turned out to be. I'm so, I'm so proud of us. Uh, well, <laughs> well, I'll, I'll, I'll take my screenwriter credit and my check, please. Okay, so I, I, I feel like that kind of wraps up some of our final thoughts, too, unless you have something more you want to say about this movie before we get to ratings. Nah, that's pretty much it. And I feel I I generally feel kind of bad like ripping on this movie because I know like I feel like a lot of the people involved probably their hearts were in the right place. It just didn't turn out like as good as maybe they had hoped it would, or maybe they didn't really know. It definitely the the shift to PG thirteen in the middle of it kind of indicates to me that maybe they didn't really know what they were going for until they kind of got their kind of deal. But like, uh, I don't know. I, 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 I wouldn't necessarily like completely just shirk off like everything that this director is ever going to do again, just because this movie sucked. I think there's some potential there and maybe with, like a better script and the, some better ideas, like for a movie, like she could probably, you know, make something a little bit more along the lines, of, you know, the better, better movies that we've mentioned that kind of explore similar themes already in this movie. They're, I think there's talent there. It just wasn't used in this movie very much, if at all. So, I don't know. I, I feel a little bit bad ripping on this. 
And again, like I, that was kind of like I, I realized within the first like ten or fifteen minutes of this, I was like, "This is a million percent not made for me." I'm a thirty-five mm-hmm. year old white dude. This is made for fifteen, sixteen year old girls. This might be like there. There's some good reviews of this on Letterbox. There's some people that absolutely love this, and uh, you know this this might be this might be real like somebody else's game, but it's uh, so not my fucking thing. It's like kind of kind of a drag yeah yeah i i would agree with that and sophia to call the uh the director has gone on to do some television work for peacock um and has done a bit of acting as well so you know good honor uh like, like you said i i don't think either of us are uh saying that you know this should be a career ender for anybody um you know it, it, it's just a bit misbegotten and um yeah i i get no pleasure from saying that this movie who's like politics i agree with a lot uh shows up as as a movie that i don't think is all that i it's just not all uh, all that well put together that's the problem yeah. Yeah. um okay so let's let's rate this thing as always uh, one to five stars. I guess you can do zero stars. We've never been there, and I don't. I would argue this movie is probably not what what's gonna bring that issue to bear. But uh, you know, we allow half stars, no uh, quarter stars, because nobody here's a monster. But <laughs> uh, where do you land on Black Christmas 2019? You know what? It's the holidays. I'm feeling kind of generous. I give this a two out of five. This isn't like. I've watched much, much worse movies than this. I thought this was bad. It's not good. Uh, But again, totally not made for me. Uh, Has elements of things that I like. And like I said, it's it's almost, this could have been a good movie if you kind of changed, you know, really not way a lot, but like some fairly crucial things. So I I give this a two out of five because I'm feeling generous. Yeah, I would give the movie we wrote like a, a solid three and a half to four out of five <laughs> yes but i agree i think this is a, a two-star movie which to me means like this isn't the worst thing you're ever gonna see but it's got some problems and i wouldn't necessarily recommend it to anyone yeah. uh, unless they were doing a you know a college paper on feminism and horror films and they would be like oh you should definitely watch this movie because that's totally what it, what it's about and it would be great as a footnote um but yeah it's not not a terrific movie so um look before we get to uh the the end of this let's talk about three things that you may not know about black christmas 2019 um i will (laughs) so one of the things that may go some distance in explaining why the movie is the way the movie is is this was uh by Su- sophia to own admission this was a work for hire job she did this was not a movie like a project that she approached blumhouse with uh blumhouse was going to d- put out a movie on december friday the 13th uh called black christmas come hell or high water and she uh was the person hired to do that so from that decision it was nine months between the time that blumhouse decided that they were going to do that and had the rights to do it to the t- the time that the movie hit theaters nine that's, months oh shit that's a super fucking fast turnaround yeah that is script to casting and my understanding is that much of the script was still being written as they were filming that a lot of the scenes were in fact largely improvised Oof. right so again goes a long way towards uh explaining why maybe the dialogue was occasionally real clunky and not necessarily great god that makes me feel even worse fucking ripping on this because that poor girl had a oh she she had to climb a fucking mountain for this one because that's oh boy that's that's rough yeah that's not great uh, but a couple of fun notes the the song that they sing in the frat house up in the frat house is, is the name of it was written by Ricky Lindholm 
who is an actress who has appeared in a number of films. I know her best as half of Garfunkel and Oates. Oh, no shit. Yeah. Okay. She is the one who is not Kate Micucci. Uh, Okay. And it was it. Jeez, one of the scary movies I want to say where she showed up naked a bunch. Anyway, I can't remember. I think but, so, yeah. Uh, but it was one of those things where I remember seeing her nude in a movie and being like, "God damn, Ricky Lindholm is kind of hot." And I never really, <laughs> I, I never really like put that together because I always thought she was just really like funny and engaging and charismatic, and never did the like. It, it took seeing her fully nude. For me to be like she is an amazingly attractive woman as well um, right. but anyway so i thought it was kind of interesting that she uh she pinned the the song uh in this um also your final uh fact that you may not know about black christmas 2019 the sorority house is uh the address is shown as 1974 elm road which ah. is, of course, a reference <laughs> to the year that the original Black Christmas came out and a nod to Nightmare on Elm Street. And, uh, you know, if, if you're going to pay homage to John Saxon, uh, why not? I think about the only other little nod that I remembered from this to the original is that uh, one of the sorority sisters kills one of the cultists with a plastic bag over their head. Which of course is like the, the basically like the poster image for the original one. Other than that, there's not way a lot of like not the original. I mean, yeah, there there's also I believe if I am not mistaken, uh, one of the sorority girls also has a unicorn statue that she uses to attack one of the fraternity guys. Like basically, the the weapons used by Billy in the original are kind of turned around. Okay. So. Yeah, that's that's uh, they tried. Yeah, they tried yeah. to do something oh, yeah. clever there. That ain't nothing. Credit uh, credit where credits due. Sure, sure. Uh again, I, I just wish um that there had been kind of more of that subtlety uh in this movie, but eh, you know. Um anyway, let's uh let's put this thing to bed. Uh, and, uh, and Mark, as always, uh, thanks for doing this, man. It's always a pleasure to chat with you. Absolutely, man. This, is, this will definitely not be the last time I, I come, come back on the show. And yeah, I, I, I always think recording with you. These, these are always interesting conversations. So, uh, yeah, th- thanks for having me, man. Absolutely. And, and people can find you at, uh, doing the nasty, the, uh, you are in the unfortunate position of recording with Duncan <laughs> McLeish. <laughs> well, it's not so much recording with Duncan. It's, it's some of the stuff that we have to watch for that show. It's the uh, for, if you've never listened to it before, is this season two uh, going through all of the video nasties, which are movies that were banned by the BBFC in the UK in the eighties. This is the, the the moral panic of the VHS tapes that were corrupting the youth. Uh, most of them are horror movies, but occasionally they sneak on like a you know a Shogun assassin or a massacre mafia style and goofy shit like that appears on there uh we just put out an episode last uh it might have been this month we're, we're playing a little bit of catch up but uh mad foxes a spanish uh nazi exploitation <laughs> biker revenge movie i think is probably my favorite thing that we covered on that show this year it's fucking bananas <laughs> uh the, they, they couldn't even put the uncut version of that on 2b the the version that's on there is missing about five minutes i, I had to order an old school DVD that Full Moon Entertainment put out to get the uncut version of that, but uh, yeah, we're, we're wrapping up season or a year or two of that. Uh, we're about halfway through the tier three list, which are movies that um, could basically be seized from video stores, but like nobody was going to jail for renting those. So those all appeared on the the first uh, the first season of the show that Duncan did with Andy Blockley. Um, th- those are all on the Teapots Collective. Uh, so if you go to tputzcast.com, you can find uh, the the podcast of the stairs and all the sideshows. Uh, you are are you guys still working on the David Fincher stuff for Opera Omnia? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We've got two to go. Uh, oh man! So yeah, we I, I just watched Gone Girl the other day again. So that conversation uh, should be happening pretty soon. I'm very excited. What uh, comes after that, Mank? Mank, yeah, that's the last one that he's done so far, and 
as of this conversation, I don't believe that Duncan has seen Mank yet. Okay. I, I did really like the episodes on that, that season that you guys did about Fight Club and Seven, which are two movies that were very near and dear to teenage Mark and were very, it came, it came along at a very formative time in my uh, movie watching history. But uh, yeah, you, you can find all that stuff in addition to doing the nasty over there. Uh, I think I, we were talking earlier about uh, what we got left to record for the rest of the year. I think this is about it. We just did on Sunday the last doing the nasty for the year, which was um, George Romero's Martin and Hell some, something uh, escape from hell. It's a really terrible women in prison movie from Italy, which I felt a little bad pairing Martin, which is arguably a fucking masterpiece yeah. of a movie up with a, a terrible, terrible Italian women in prison movie, which we both absolutely hated but uh that should be out here pretty quick about the only other thing i got recording this year is another we're gonna try and get one more with uh darren wilson over on his uh the uh the comic book movie shows uh i think we both came to the consensus that like uh doing all the marvel movies in order sounds kind of fucking boring so we're gonna kind of hop around and i think we're gonna talk about judge dread on the next episode or at least the uh the, the the good one the oh, 2012 the, the, uh, the keith urban the, one yeah the, the, yeah the 2012 Car, carl urban one uh yeah it's uh i i, I ordered some some 2000 ad comics because uh, there, there's also a really great documentary called future shock the the story of 2000 ad mm-hmm. comics the, for those that don't know 2000 ad is kind of like the punk rock little brother to dc and marvel comics and uh yeah, they're, they're sort of like those if you cross them with like Mad Magazine or something. But uh, that uh, we still have yet to record that. We're gonna try and sneak that in before the end of the year, and that's about it. Then it's back to 2022, and uh, yeah, so there's more stuff. I will definitely, I'll definitely come back on this show anytime you'll have me. I'm, I'm hoping. No, uh, we'll talk a little bit off air. I'm, I'm hoping you got some some more cool stuff planned for this show because i i'm definitely excited to come back yeah for sure uh next month is all going to be one-offs instead of uh you know taking a break from doing a series for a month um and just doing some random shit that i just like okay so uh but i'll i'll give you that list uh off air and if anything strikes your fancy so far richard uh glinch has picked one and I was like, "All right, all right. Well, I've got I've got my list of movies that I want to talk about just because, uh, you know, it's January. It's the start of a new year, and and let's kick it off with just some stone cold bangers of movies. Sweet, yeah. So, uh, all right. Thanks again, buddy. I will uh, be right back to close the show. All right, there you have it. That is Black Christmas. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the conversation. I I definitely enjoyed having it." Um, it really crystallized my thoughts on why I think this movie does not work entirely, even though there are things about it that I do find admirable. I'm not going to lie. I, there, are, there are things about this movie I like a lot. Uh, I wish that it delivered on its promise. Um, at any rate, coming in January, we are not doing another series. We're doing a, a bunch of one-off films that I'm excited to talk about, so... Uh, just to give you an idea of what's ahead uh, in January, we will be doing Lose with Richard Glenn Schmidt uh, just next week. Um, we're going to be talking about Brides of Dracula, the Hammer Horror film. We're going to be talking about Behind the Mask, The Rise of Leslie Vernon, and we're going to be talking about American Mary. So uh, in February is going to be a, a new series of movies, but I think you are going to enjoy uh, the next month or so of uh of dark parade nonsense and as always thank you very much for listening of course we've got bonus episodes hitting all the time uh there's usually a bonus episode on monday and friday um usually a found footage full or what you're watching with jamie and Bo, or heart of horror or it could be anything you guys could be anything that's the the genius of the dark parade uh is that much like a parade itself there are a number of curiosities floating by to attract your attention. And uh, there's going to be new stuff coming soon. Uh, I promise. I'm, I'm slowly but surely working my way into a place where uh, I can do a lot of, of new and fun stuff. So anyway, all that aside, I hope you enjoy 
uh, not just this Black Christmas uh, uh, retrospective. I hope you have enjoyed the Dark Parade in 2021. I'm very excited to bring you more stuff in 2022. And uh, as always, rate and review. And the biggest thing you can do to help the show is just share it around. Like if you enjoyed an episode, share it with uh, people who, who you think might enjoy that episode. Um, you don't have to share the whole thing if you want, if you don't want, I don't care, whatever, whatever gets people to hit the subscribe button, I'll run around with like fresh bean and cheese burritos for deliciousness. I don't know. I'm not sure that that would actually persuade anybody, but I'm willing to do it. That's the important thing. Anyway, thanks very much for listening, everyone. We'll see you in a week with Luz and Richard Glenn Schmidt. And uh, a little bit of found footage fool on uh, on Friday and Sinister Sunday on Sunday. So uh, there you have it. We'll talk to you real soon. And thanks as always for taking a ride on the Dark Parade.